To The Point with Michael Williams. Good morning and an early happy 4th of July to all of you. My interview today is with Eve Samples. She's the executive director of Friends of the Everglades. Toxic algae on Lake Okeechobee raising big worries this summer about what's to come. What if we get a bad Atlantic storm and the Army Corps of Engineers decides later this summer that it must send water east into the St. Lucie River estuary and Indian River Lagoon in order to lower lake levels? It's a nightmare we've seen before and everyone can only hope that the worst case might be avoided. Lake Okeechobee is alarmingly high right now, about 14 and a half feet. And on top of that, it's filled with toxic algae. More than half of the lake has been spotted with uh, cyanobacteria, blue-green algae. We're familiar with this phenomenon. We experienced it on the coast back in 2018 and 2016. And the concern now is that as the rainy season progresses and the lake rises, that the Army Corps of Engineers will discharge that toxic algae-laden water east and west at damaging volumes. And we're going to be faced with another toxic summer on the coast. Another potential lost summer. How do we get here again? I always have viewers say we, we seem to repeat, repeat, repeat. Right. So the problem is twofold. Number one, it's a water quality problem. We have way too much nutrient pollution in our waterways, phosphorus and nitrogen. That's mainly a result of agricultural runoff. And the second part of the problem is water management, the way we move water in and out of Lake Okeechobee. There's still a huge blockade south of the lake. Not enough clean water can flow south of the lake because of the sugarcane industry occupying about 400,000 acres there. And we still need more land to clean lake water and send it south to the Everglades, which needs that water. A reservoir project expected to be completed south of the big lake in the late 2020s, early 2030s uh, could be a big help, but that's still years off. What in the meantime? Right. So the EAA reservoir will have 37 foot high embankment walls. It's a four billion dollar project. There are a lot of questions about whether that project will be able to meet water quality standards because the Everglades needs clean water when water flows south. Uh, but to your question, Michael, in the meantime, what do we do? So number one, the water management part of the equation it does have some options. The Army Corps of Engineers is about to implement a new Lake Okeechobee operating plan. It'll be implemented later this year. Unfortunately, there's been about a six month delay and that will allow for some more flexibility when there is toxic algae in the lake. Also, the Army Corps, because the Herbert Hoover Dyke around the lake has been rehabbed, the Army Corps is more comfortable holding water higher in the lake, so it could buy us some time before we have to get those damaging discharges to the coast. Unfortunately, even under the new lake plan, when that takes effect, once the lake gets over about 16 and a half feet, all bets are off. We're still going to be faced with toxic discharges in years when the lake is high and there's toxic algae on the lake. So. Operational flexibility will be our friend in, in the months to come until we have that storage and water treatment that's adequate south of the lake. But again, that's some years away. We also have a water cleansing project in the C-44 reservoir project, but that's not up and running fully either. So it's projects that have been promised, often delayed. There's technical issues. Um, and, and a lot of people who live and work along the Treasure Coast just feel the alacrity, uh, the focused, consistent concern to finally get answers that stick just is not there. What do you say to those frustrations? I feel those frustrations. It's been 10 years since the last summer of 2013 when the community rose up in the Stewart area, Lake Worth area also has experienced toxic algae. We demanded a solution. The state legislature did move forward with this reservoir plan. The Army Corps of Engineers has had a shift in philosophy and has become more flexible at least. But yet here we are staring down the barrel of a gun again, looking at Lake Okeechobee with toxic algae. So it's incredibly frustrating. And um, when I get frustrated, I, I remind myself that um, these kinds of crises can result in solutions and, and our community really does rise up. And that solution still requires more land, more public land south of Lake Okeechobee to truly restore the river of grass. Our, our founder, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas at Friends of the Everglades coined that term river of grass. And 
building these very highly engineered tall deep reservoirs can't be the sole solution we still need more land to create uh, cleansing marshes to send clean water south we cannot ignore and i know you certainly do not that we also have the issues with a lot of urbanization along our coastlines that's certainly part of it there's a big issue in martin county or a big effort in martin county to go from septic to sewer so uh, nobody's absolved of having to do their part. We all love to fertilize our lawns. There's new restrictions. It's, it's a holistic look, but we can't ignore any piece of it, including the big piece on and south of the lake and the piece where a lot of people live and work and love to be near the waterway. Speak to that too. You're absolutely right. It has to be a holistic approach. So growth management is a big part of the equation. You know, you look out at what's happening in Arizona where there's not enough water and there's a, a real battle over how many new homes can or should be permitted to be built. In Florida, we have kind of the opposite part of that problem where we're building homes on wetlands often, and that takes away flood control, flood capacity, uh, water cleansing capacity. So we need to protect our wetlands and, and not allow them to be filled in and built upon in irresponsible ways. So growth management, smart growth policies is really impor important in Florida. And then there's some really common sense, popular things we can do in our local communities like fertilizer ordinances that ban the application of fertilizer on lawns during the rainy season. Many communities in the Palm Beaches, the Treasure Coast have embraced these ordinances. Unfortunately, our state legislature just advanced a ban, a moratorium for a year on new ordinances like that in the year to come. And that was something that the fertilizer industry asked for, specifically True Green, the company lobbied for that change. And we think that's moving backwards. We've got a, a toxic algae crisis. We need to be embracing these common sense solutions. How uh, you obviously were surprised uh... And I would think even more so given that the governor on water issues has been forward leaning in the mind of a lot of environmentalists. Yeah, so there's big money in the state budget attached to Everglades and water related projects. And we see a real disconnect between these big funding allocations, big budget allocations, and what we're seeing in terms of policy measures out of Tallahassee. So until we bridge that divide, we're not going to have meaningful progress. We're going to continue to see lost summers. We need both the funding and the common sense pollution control policy measures. Kind of rounding back to where we began, but for this summer, we have to hope that Mother Nature does not give us big storms, that the lake doesn't go over 16 and a half feet. It's 14 plus now. And you're saying the Army Corps says they would not start discharges until it was at that level. So there's a lot of hope built into the equation uh, that they just don't have to do releases and are more sensitive to it, because if they do, um, it's going to be ugly. That's right. So we've been lucky the last five years because Mother Nature was forgiving. The question is, will that pattern continue this year? We have a high lake. There's an El Nino. Now we're officially in an El Nino weather cycle. That means it's more likely to be rainy. However, El Nino can break up the tropical storms that also dump a lot of water on Lake Okeechobee. So we're going to see how, how this plays out in the next few months. Um, between now and September is really going to be a critical time for the health of our waterways. And I just want to reiterate that if we do get toxic algae in the populated areas, and even for folks who go out to Lake Okeechobee right now, this stuff is a real public health threat. Don't fish in it. Don't swim near it. If you see it, make sure you keep your distance. We know these toxins can be aerosolized. It's not safe stuff. Um, so it's about more than just protecting our environment. It's really a public health crisis. Uh, one last question I hear sometimes talked about by our legislative leaders, too. If if, if worse comes to worse, uh, would lawsuits be considered to try and stop discharges or would uh, that have any practical effect if they say, hey, the lake's too high, we're going to release anyway. But are lawsuits a last resort here? Yeah, so we have seen litigation related to how the lake is managed. That litigation has related to endangered species, and the Army Corps of Engineers had to react to that. I do think that the, some of the most meaningful progress we've made in the environmental realm in Florida and really in the country has come through the courts. Friends of the Everglades has been engaged in Clean Water Act litigation over the years. So 
we, we would like to think that we could avoid that kind of long drawn out process. Um, but in the end, when we're looking at lost summers, decade after decade, sometimes the courts are the only remedy. Finally, we could talk on this topic. It's so broad, so deep, so challenging, but what are any final points you'd like to add that I haven't touched on? I think there's a real growth in awareness among Floridians about the importance of clean water to our health, to our local economies, to our ecosystems. And, and that's the vision of Florida that we're really fighting for. We do still have hope that we can enjoy the green spaces that make up what was once the greater Everglades ecosystem, that we can protect our clean water for future generations. You know, I, I have a 14 year old son and, and I have to believe that there will be a better day for him and um, that we can win this fight. So have to stay optimistic. Up next, the Roundtable with Brian Crowley.